Hello and welcome to our first installment of our new unit, Solutions. So this, this is basically going to be, for the most part, review and there's a little bit of um, new stuff but it only has to do with definitions so there isn't actually any homework attached to your notes. So as you know, water is the universal solvent. So what that means is basically if you're going to dissolve something in um, something, it's going to be in water. And, um, and that's pretty much what we deal with all the time, our solutions, as solutes dissolved in the solvent of water. Uh, as you recall from uh, grade 9, actually, matter is made up of two main things. Uh, the first one, the first category, pure substances. Pure substances are broken down into elements and compounds. Then we have mixtures. These are a little bit more complicated. Today, or for now, we're going to talk a little bit about solutions. Solutions are homogeneous. Um, they're clear. And if they're in liquid form, and they are... Um, they could be colored, but in liquid form, they're clear. Mechanical mixtures, you can tell the difference with your naked eye, so a combo of salt and pepper. Suspensions and colloids are both opaque. However, with suspensions, they are uh, the suspensions are easily filtered just by filter paper, for example. Uh, tomato juice is an, is an example of a suspension. If I take some filter paper, I can actually collect all the to uh, tomato bits. Colloids are a little bit more complicated. They kind of look like solutions in that they're opaque, but they're very difficult to separate. For example, milk and uh, milk's an example and paint. So obviously when milk goes bad, you can see the different parts, but when milk is not bad, it, it's, it's a colloid. It looks like one thing. So solutions are homogeneous mixtures composed of at least one solute that is dissolved and one solvent where it's dissolved in. And usually you could tell that it's dissolved in water when you see AQ. AQ means this particular compound dissolved in water. Here's an example. If I have NaCl, AQ, and NaCl, solid, they're both salt. This one's table salt, right? And this is table salt dissolved in water. So the chemical formula of a solution specifies the solute by using its chemical formula and the solvent by placing in parentheses. Here's an example. Ammonia gas is the solute. Water is the solvent. And in this example, too, we have solid iodine dissolved in alcohol. Now, that's just a little bit of information for you. Definitely not going to test you on that. Here's some examples of solutions. Um, a gas solution would be air. That would be an example of a solution that is a gas. Nitrogen is the higher amount, and then these guys are your solutes, oxygen being one of them, very important. Uh, an example of a liquid is brine. This we use in um, culinary, in the culinary arts. Water is the solvent, and in this case here, we have sodium chloride, which is table salt. Basically, you put meat in there, and it tenderizes it, it makes it super juicy. You can also include other spices and, uh, and sometimes sugar. Uh, solid, an example of a solid solution is brass. If you take a look at brass, it just looks like one thing, but it's a combo. The highest part of brass is, or the, the biggest percentage is copper, and the, small, and the zinc is, is the smaller percentage. So solute particles can be either ionic or molecular. They are usually polar, and as a result will dissolve in water, creating an aqueous solution. However, nonpolar Nonpolar solutes will not dissolve in water. Remember in bonding, we looked at polar and nonpolar, like dissolves like. They will only dissolve in other nonpolar solvents. This is because according to solubility theory, like dissolves like, and that was that you learned already in our bonding unit. Here's an example. Here's an example. Iodine, um, iodine a nonpolar solute, dissolves in carbon tetrachloride because it's also nonpolar. If you remember, looks like this. Okay, and um, but will not dissolve in water, a polar solvent due to differences in polarity. If we have water, H2O, you recall that this side is negative, this side is positive. Here, the whole outside is either going to be negative or positive, so it's not polar. When a solute dissolves, the solvent particles attract the solute particles, causing the individual particles to break away from one another. That's because of the, the positive and negative charges they attract. As a result, the particles become solvated, 
this is just a little information for you. It's kind of a cool word. You're not going to be tested on it, though. What that means is surrounded by the solvent particles, and then they dissolve. Recall that you learned about factors affecting the rate of uh, dissolving. That would have been junior high and, and possibly grade 10. There are four factors that affect the rate at which a solute dissolves. The temperature, if I heat something up, it will dissolve more. If I'm dissolving sugar in water, if I want to dissolve more sugar in water, I just heat it up the solution and then I can dissolve more sugar in water. Particle size, you guys know that surface area. If I take a cube of sugar and I take a tablespoon of sugar, the tablespoon of sugar is going to dissolve faster. Nature of the particle, uh, for this case, it depends if it's a compound. You look at the solubility table. If it's a molecule, you'll, take, you'll see if it's uh, polar or nonpolar. And agitation, all that means is if you stir things around, you're just basically moving the particles faster and that's going to increase the rate of solubility. So those are four factors that affect solubility. Water of hydration, remember we learned about hydrates in grade 10, and basically a hydrate is an um, ionic substance that has some water particles inside the, the uh, compound, and it just makes it look different. So cool. Many substances have water as part of their crystal structure. These substances are called hydrates. And how can you tell it's a hydrate? Well, if, if in the name it'll tell you, hydrate. Penta becomes uh, kind of like a coefficient. 5H2O. That's how you can uh, name it, or that's the name pentahydrate, that's the chemical formula, and you have copper 2 sulfate. And you have this dot here that's also indicative that something is a hydrate. So in other words, uh, if I take copper 2 sulfate and it contains five water molecule molecules in its crystal structure and chemical composition, we then call it a hydrate. It's not dissolved in, it's still a solid, it just has water particles inside of the chemical formula. Say some other part of properties of aqueous solutions, they could either be neutral, they could be acidic, or they could be basic. So this is review. Again, acids form as, uh, acidic solutions when dissolved in water. What are some characteristics or properties? They taste sour. They have a pH less than 7. They neutralize bases. They react with active metals, typically group 1 and group 2, to produce hydrogen gas. For example, if I take HCl, and I uh, react it with, I don't know, magnesium. Okay, it's gonna, it's a single replacement reaction. These two will, will uh, displace or change. So you have H2 gas plus MgCl. Now this always happens. You have your metal, it's gonna change with the, the hydrogen portion of the acid, which is a positive cation or a cation. They react with carbonates to produce carbon dioxide. Okay, bases, they form basic solutions and when they're dissolved in water. They taste bitter, they have a pH higher than 7, they neutralize acids, and they feel slippery. For you guys right now, but this will change, a base is something that has hydroxide in it. So NaOH, this is an ionic compound. If I take NaOH and I dissolve it in water, the presence of OH, an uh, oxygen, hydroxide ion makes the substance a base and then it will exhibit these properties only when they're dissolved in, when um, the NaOH is dissolved in water. So diagnostic test, litmus paper, red litmus paper, red litmus paper turns blue in the presence of a base. Blue litmus paper turns red in the presence of an acid. If red litmus paper stays red and blue litmus paper stays blue, then the solution is neutral. Okay? Naming acids, let's take a look at a review. Now, in your data booklet in grade 10, you had this big chart of how to name acids and the three different types, because we're going to basically uh, worry about the classical naming system. In your data booklet, you have a teeny tiny version of that, and that is found on the first page, uh, bottom left-hand corner. There's a wee box that talks about the rules, how, but I'll go over them now. If the anion name ends in "-ide", the corresponding acid is named. You have the prefix hydro and the suffix ic. If the anion name, now you guys know the anion is the second part, right? So this is your first part. And then, for example, 8, this would be something like this. So if it were just a compound, it would be hydrogen nitrate, right? But if it's an acid, 
then you take the, um, the eight part away and you substitute it with the ick and there's no hydro. There's no hydro if, uh, if the second portion ends in ate. If the section portion ends in ite, then you take the ite part away and you put ous and then the word acid. So here's some practice. I'd like you to, in a, in a couple of seconds, just pause the video, try these out. Something to keep in mind though, when you have uh, something that ends in COO in your polyatomic ion chart, I think there's four examples. Remember, some, if that is an acid, the H goes at the very end. Okay, kiddos? So pause. Welcome back. Here's the key. I um, hope you guys had fun with that. You do have to know how to name acids. Basis is pretty easy. You just have hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, whatever hydroxide. Properties of aqueous solutions. So this is a new word that you may not have heard before. Electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. Basically, we're talking about what conducts electricity. So electrolytes are compounds that conduct electricity in an aqueous solution or in a molten state. So if you dissolve them in water or if you melt the substance and it conducts electricity, it is an electrolyte. Electrolytic solutions include all soluble, ionic, acidic, and basic solutions. So those are the three types of solutions that are electrolytes, okay? So ionic compounds that are either in aqueous form or they're molten, they are electrolytes. They will conduct electricity. Any acids, now acids are always aqueous or else it's not an acid, and any basic solutions. So this is a basic solution. It has to be a solution, which means it has to be dissolved in water. Those guys will uh, also be electrolytes. Obviously, NaOH is a, is a an ionic compound. If it's molten, it will also be an electrolyte. So non-electrolytes are aqueous solutions that do not conduct electricity. And there's only one example you have to know, and that's all molecular substances. Molecular substances I'm writing this down, sorry, are never, ever electrolytes. Never. It doesn't matter if you melt them, doesn't matter if you dissolve them in water, it doesn't matter if you ask them nicely, they will not conduct electricity. An example of sugar, so sugar, the difference is this, if I take salt, and I dissolve it in water. It's going to break down into these ions, the sodium ion and the chloride ion. Okay, It's the ions that conduct electricity. If I take sugar and I dissolve it in water, I just get smaller bits of sugar. It doesn't break down into carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It just becomes smaller bits of sugar. So those will never, molecular substance will never, ever, ever, ever be electrolytes, ever. So an exception is a substance such as ammonia, since ammonia is able to dissociate. Now here's the thing, we'll learn about this later. Ammonia is actually a base. I know. We'll talk about that later, okay? Ammonia is actually a base because of the fact, well actually a scientist first decided it wasn't a base because it looks like a molecular compound. But then when they um, dissolved it in water and they took uh, blue and red litmus paper to it, it showed up as a base and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, what is actually a base? But we'll talk about that when we do our units on acids and bases. For right now, just know that that's an exception. To determine whether or not a substance is an electrolyte, a diagnostic test is performed using either a conductivity apparatus or an ohm meter. Basically, we take a, a little meter that measures a, uh, electric current or you can have some fun and just attach a light bulb two metals and then put them in your your solution if the if the if the bulb lights up it's an electrolyte if it doesn't light up it's a non-electrolyte so the light will glow 
if the light glows, conductivity is detected, it's an electrolyte. If there's no light, conductivity is not detected, and it's a non-electrolyte. If you're using a meter, all you have to see is it could still be like a little gauge if it's, uh, if it's a simpler kind of meter, or you'll have a screen saying, hey, there's, 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 there's movement of electrons, or your gauge is going to move one way or the other. So strong versus weak electrolytes, this is super obvious, guys. I, my apologies. A strong electrolyte, a large portion of the solute dissociates and exists as ions. As a result, the bulb burns brightly. A weak electrolyte, a small portion of the solute dissociates and exists as ions. As a result, the bulb does not burn as brightly. So basically what that means is if I have to have a strong electrolyte, for example, if I have NaCl and I'm going to add water to it, it's going to break down into Na ions, so your sodium ions, and your chloride ions. What this means, where it says a large portion of the solute dissociates, what that means, if I have five grams of this, for example, every, almost every single gram is going to dissociate. I'm going to have more than 99% of this, these five grams are actually going to break down into sodium ions and chloride ions. Sometimes this is like about 30%. Right, so only about 30% of whatever compound this is, is going to break down into its ions. This is a weak electrolyte, this is a strong electrolyte. That's it, have a nice day. And um, no homework, just relax. Maybe go over how to name acids again. Okay, take care.